This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Good evening, and welcome to the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging's monthly public lecture series. My name is Kui Bulo. I'm a clinical professor of medicine here at the medical school and deputy director for community outreach and education at the Stein Institute. At the Stein Institute, we are committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, education, and community outreach. This public lecture series is an example of just one of our outreach programs. This series has been sponsored by the Stein Institute for over 20 years with the goal of connecting the community with exciting and meaningful advances in uh, aging research. We're able to offer these lectures free to the public uh, due to the generous contributions from our community donors. If you appreciate the lectures that we provide, please consider making a tax-deductible charitable contribution to the Stein Institute. To make a donation or to learn more about the Stein, uh, please uh, visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu or come up and talk to us after the lecture. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce, you, uh, introduce to you one of my colleagues and speaker for the evening, Dr. Heather Hofflick. Dr. Hofflick is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. She completed her undergraduate education at Cornell University, her medical education at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, her internal medicine residency at the Beth Israel Medical Center in New York, and her endocrinology fellowship at UC Irvine before joining the faculty here at UC San Diego in 2008. Her professional and academic interests are in the areas of osteoporosis, thyroid disease, and diabetes management. Those of us who practice here at UCSD have come to rely on her expertise in osteoporosis, and I have personally appreciated the in-depth consultations that she has provided to my own patients. She works closely with her patients to educate them about osteoporosis treatment as well as fracture prevention, and she has started a very popular bone health support group that offers monthly educational seminars. The title of her talk tonight is Osteoporosis Update 2013. Please join me now in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Hofflick. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, um, welcome, and I'm excited tonight to give you the most up-to-date information that I can on osteoporosis. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to go through a lot of information tonight, um, but I want you, um, you know, so you may have a lot of questions, but I'll go through everything that I can, just a, a brief overview of osteoporosis as I know it, and I want you to leave knowing as much as I do um, about osteoporosis, so I'm going to give you a lot of information, so, um, so I hope you'll enjoy it. So, um, so I'll talk about some different causes and therapies and controversies that are associated today. So the definition of osteoporosis is impaired bone strength due to low bone mineral density and poor bone quality. And when you have osteoporosis, as you can see in this sl slide, the bone gets very thin, very weak, and is more susceptible to fracture. So bone strength equals a lot of things. So bone density is just one component, the one thing that we can measure um, for us that makes up our bone strength. But there's other things too, bone quality, damage to our bone, 
the damage to the architecture. So there's many things that go into the strength of our bone and not even bone density alone really isn't all that is there. So there's many risk factors for osteoporosis just with diet and lifestyle alone. Um, low calcium intake, vitamin D deficiency, high salt or caffeine intake, immobilization. Alcohol is a big risk factor for um, developing osteoporosis when you drink more than three drinks a day. Um, inadequate physical activity, um, so not doing any weight bearing, low body mass index and smoking um, is a di directly uh, toxic to the bone. So there's many risk factors for osteoporosis. And as you can see here, um, this is just taking women with osteoporosis fractures, but there's more fractures compared with other diseases, heart attack, stroke, there's more um, hip fractures and overall osteoporotic fractures. And as you know, getting a hip fracture can be a major cause of landing somebody in the hospital. There's consequences to that. And so it is a very major um, healthcare issue that we should be aware of. So, and the consequences are hip fracture, which can occur in the hip, or spine fractures um, and many other type of osteoporotic, but these are compression fractures where the spine shortens. And so these are things that we want to prevent by learning more today about osteoporosis. So how do we diagnose osteoporosis in someone? So many of you may have experienced this or seen this machine. This is a DEXA machine, a bone density test. And it's actually very low radiation. It's less radiation than an x-ray. And it can tell us some information um, about, we look at the femoral neck or the hip and the spine to compare the bone density and see um, it. But it only measures two areas, as I said. It measures your bone mineral content over your area. And so many of you may be familiar with our scoring system, which is an interesting system, which um, hopefully in the future may be changed, but we use something called a T-score. And a T-score is your bone mineral density compared to a young normal adult of the same sex. Um, and this is really the criteria that we have now. This is the gold standard on how to diagnose osteoporosis. So if your T-score is above or equal to minus one, then you are considered to have normal bone density. If it's between minus one and minus 2.5, it is something called osteopenia, or pre-osteoporosis, as we may cause it. And when your T-score is minus 2.5 or lower, meaning minus 2.5, minus 2.8, minus three, going that way, you have osteoporosis. Now, anybody that has a fragility fracture, meaning a fracture caused from standing at normal height or a spontaneous fracture, something that you wouldn't expect not arising from major trauma, that alone, even if your bone density is normal or just osteopenic, that alone is osteoporosis by definition. So the indications for bone mineral density testing have changed. The National Osteoporosis Foundation um, in 2008 has set a new criteria. So women aged greater than 65 years and older should have a bone density, but we did add this other population. So now all men over age 70, it is recommended that you have a bone mineral density test as well. As we kn do know that hip fracture actually, ha there is a higher incidence in men. The average age for hip fracture is 81, and more men actually hip have hip fractures than women. So it's very important, and we're aware that men also need a bone density scan for screening. Um, and then any woman or male at age 50 to 69 that has a risk factor, which I'll get into risk factors in a little bit, and anybody who fractures after age 50, um, these are all reasons to have a bone mineral density test. So what are some, there's also other causes of osteoporosis, secondary causes, and I'm not going to go through it tonight, but you can see there's a huge list of things that can le make your bones weaker. So some of the major things and in men is something called hypogonadism, where you have a testosterone deficiency. So as men age, um, they can their testosterone declines, thus leading to loss of bone as well, because testosterone helps to mineralize the bone. Um, and also in women, as at menopausal years, we lose our estrogen supply, and thus that puts our bones at risk for osteoporosis. Um, and then there's other medical conditions, vitamin D deficiency, um, diabetes has been associated, um, and there's other causes with increased calcium in the urine and other causes that your doctor should look into um, to see if there's other reasons if you have osteoporosis. 
um, certain types of um, bariatric surgery when people lose weight very rapidly. So people who are having gastric bypass or uh, can lose their minerals, vitamin, become deficient and also become at risk for osteoporosis. Certain medications, um, uh, cancers, alcohol and smoking um, are also other causes in kidney and liver diseases. So there are, just to highlight some of the medications that can lead to bone loss, um, steroids are a big risk factor, not in the short term, not injections that you're necessarily receiving or a short course when you have, um, you know, a pneumonia or asthma or a respiratory infection, but a long-term course um, greater than five milligrams a day of the most common one, prednisone, for greater than three months. So being on a long course of steroids does put you more at risk for bone loss. Um, immunosuppressants for different diseases um, can do it. Heparin and Coumadin, I leave that up there as classically high doses, but actually Coumadin does not affect osteoporosis at the low doses that people are commonly on. Um, and some anticonvulsants can do it, something called Dilantin, a therapy that used to be used for seizures can cause increased um, loss of vitamin D, metabolism of vitamin D and produce it. Um, some pain medications can be associated with bone loss. Um, and then the big thing now is um, any woman treated with breast cancer these days, a lot of women are receiving a medicine called Arimidex um, or Anastrozole, which is associated actually with, with a higher risk of fracture. It cuts off their estrogen supply and leads them susceptible to osteoporosis. So this is a big field um, and I see a lot of patients, breast cancer patients that need to go on medications because they are at risk. And also men um, that have prostate cancer and receive um, something called Lupron or androgen deprivation therapy, their supply of testosterone is cut off and it puts them at risk for osteoporosis. So these men may need to go on medication. So these are all, there are a lot of medications. Now there's some newer ones that you may have heard about in the news recently and I'll talk about it later, but just to mention there has been in the literature association of antidepressants actually, but more thoughts that may, perhaps they lead to problems with balance. This hasn't been established so it's not to say go off an antidepressant or anything like that, but they're doing studies to see um, whether or not there is a link. And I'll talk about um, Many people are on something, a uh, proton pump inhibitor used for reflux therapy. And there was some thoughts over the last few years that perhaps that medication um, decreases calcium absorption and that perhaps people in that medicine might be at risk that their calcium is not getting absorbed and they may be associated with fractures and osteoporosis. And actually, uh, um, that is not in the most recent study that has been found not to be true, um, that it was more in smokers that were taking this long term. So we'll see, there's been some literature about that. And there is a diabetic medication, um, something called pioglitazone or Actos, that we actually don't use anymore um, a lot due to another reason it was thought to be an increased risk of bladder cancer, but this was a very popular medicine that was used that actually was associated with hip fractures in women. So we don't, you wanna be careful with that medicine as well. So the question becomes, there's all these risk factors, how do we figure out who to treat? So someone comes in, gets their bone density test, and then um, the question is, do you need treatment for your osteoporosis? So there's been a lot of changes since 2008 on how we decide. Um, so you can see here, a lot of people, um, and maybe some of you in the audience, used to see their physician maybe at menopausal years, 50 in a woman, and they said, you need to go, it's time to go on Fosmax. Here it is, and you need to go on a bisphosphonate. And what happened is we were taking people um, back before 2008 and even if your T-score was this number minus two, we treated you for osteopenia and we said you need a medication. Now of course those at higher risk need, need a treatment and got treated, but we were treating a lot of the lower risk patients and everyone just with this number got treated. And now we realized that um, the high risk patients we definitely treat if your T-score is minus 2.5, but what do we really do about these people in the mid-range, these people with osteopenia or pre-osteoporosis? Do they need a medication um, or is there something else we can do? And then of course the, there's low risk. So you can see that, th that the people in the mid-range with osteopenia minus 1.5 one, minus one to minus 2.5. Actually, the number of fractures is increased in this group, but of course the rate of fractures is more common in the osteoporotic group. So the question is, who needs the treatment and how do we figure out who's the right candidate? And you can see here that age is a risk factor for fracture. 
So if we took someone with a T-score, and this is considered osteoporosis at age 50, their risk of fracture is about 12%. Their absolute 10-year risk that they're going to have a fracture. But if we took that same patient at age 70 with that same score, their fracture risk went up to 24%, and they definitely need treatment. So this shows you that younger patients, people may not need to have treatment, and that you know other young, older people may be more high risk. We also realized that having a fracture, especially a low trauma fracture, something that happens more spontaneously, puts someone at increased risk. So if you have two patients at age 60 at the same score on their bone density and one had a um, fracture and one didn't, you can see the, fracture rate, the risk of a future fracture is much higher in the patient that um, had the fracture. So this also is a risk factor. So that's what happened, and many of you may have seen this tool used by your physician. It's called the FRAC score, and it's what I use every day in my office to tell people how are they at risk for a fracture. And what you do is on a website is you go down and you can see, I would pick US depending on, and you can look based on ethnicity, and we are able to calculate someone's risk. And what I do is we look at the risk factors. So there's age, there's the sex, male versus female, weight and height are very important. So people with very low body weight, less than about 125 pounds are at risk for osteoporosis. We put in their height to, to calculate. Anyone with a previous fracture, and this means a low trauma fracture, is at risk, so that box can be checked off. Anyone whose parent fractured their hip is actually a big risk factor um, for a future fracture. fracture. Any current smoking, um, steroid use, as I discussed before, Rheumatoid arthritis um, is a risk factor independently, even um, alone, it can actually cause deterioration and breakdown of the bone. And any secondary osteoporosis, so as I talked about before, vitamin D deficiency or any other cause. And anyone who's drinking alcohol uh, more than three glasses a day, that is a risk factor as well. So what I do is I calculate and I ask everyone questions about their risk and then I come up with an answer. And so this is to give you an example of a 70-year-old female, um, height and weight, with no risk factors. And I take this T-score of minus two. And in the past, this patient definitely would have been treated and would have been put on a bisphosphonate or other osteoporotic agent, meaning Fosamax or something like that. And I calculate the 10-year risk. So when I press this button, I'll get a 10-year risk on the patient. How likely are you to have a fracture? And if this major osteoporotic, meaning at risk for any type of fracture, shoulder, spine, hip, if that's greater than 20%, or if the risk for hip fracture is greater than 3%, treatment is recommended. And this, is developed, this tool was developed by the World Health Organization and it's used across the world. And so this, now I can tell my patient at a T-score of minus two, I don't think you need a medicine at this time. You are a little lower risk, we'll watch you closely, but at this time you do not need treatment. So this shows you that somebody that probably would have been treated before will not get treated with the current system. So this is the guidelines. We use this score. Um, and if so, if they have osteopenia minus one to minus 2.5, we look at their 10-year probability of a fracture. So this is just shows you, just highlights that we used to just treat everybody um, ages 50 to 85. If your T-score was minus uh, two and osteoporosis, you got treated. But now what we're doing is we're not treating younger patients, and we're treating older patients who may not have gotten treated, but they have risk factors. Um, or just based on their age alone, we're treating people even if their T-scores are lower. And someone you say, oh, your bones look good. Well, now you see, but maybe there are risks when you type them into the calculator. So I think now we have a better idea of who we're treating and we're treating the right population. So this is intended for anybody age 50 or older, the scoring system. And you have to have not been on treatment for at least two years to be able to use it because it can create some false uh, positives. Um, and so you can use the total, and the other caveat is it's not based on the spine bone density, it's based on the hip. So a lot of people might have severe spine osteoporosis and you have to then make a clinical decision, but you base it on the patient's hip score um, alone. So this is only a guideline and there could be other reasons. So now I'll go over some of the therapies for osteoporosis and just give you a brief summary of what is out there. So this is, so as you can see already, we diagnose with a bone density, we make a decision, and then we can consider treatment in the right population. 
So first I want to take a, some time to talk about the non-pharmacological approaches as this is very big today. So you want to make sure that you have an adequate intake of dietary calcium, regular physical activity, minimize alcohol as we discussed before, less than three glasses a day, um, encourage smoking, um, smoking is very, very bad for the bone, and minimize fall risk. So your mother always told you to drink milk, and she was right. Milk is a great source of calcium, and that is one of the best ways. So the big change in the last year is that if you can get your calcium through your diet, that is key. So um, basically, and I put up here the calcium calculator, um, I encourage all my patients in the exam room, I, I teach them how to go over and count their calcium and see if they're getting enough calcium in their diet. So milk is an excellent source, and actually fortified orange juice is another very good source of calcium, cheese, yogurt. So what I do, and we'll give you this handout, you probably have it here, is you can go day by day and calculate how much you're taking. And just by eating alone, you get already get an automatic 250. So what I'm realizing is I'm, I'm teaching my patients to do this, that a lot of people already get about 600 to 800 or 1,000 milligrams alone in their diet, and that's good. So when they come time to ask me, well, should I be on a supplement, I say, yes, you can supplement after. So if you're getting 600 milligrams in your diet, take one 600 milligram calcium. You only need one supplement a day. And this is big because we used to be taught that 1,500 milligrams of calcium is what's recommended. Well, we've changed that. 1,200 milligrams is actually the absolute um, amount of calcium that should be taken, and if you can get it through the diet first, that's great. If you get 1,200 milligrams in your diet, then you do not need a supplement at this time. Now, if you do need a supplement, a lot of people always ask me, well, what type of calcium is best? What supplement should I take? And really, the choice is yours, because they're all good, and, but there are a couple of caveats that you need to know. So calcium carbonate, is a type of calcium, you really have to look on the bottle, and calcium carbonate needs to be taken with food for best absorption. And calcium carbonate's found in some of these, chew in this chewable, so if anybody takes the Viactive chews, there's other ways, you don't have to swallow a pill. You can take these chews, they come in all different flavors. Um, and then they also have the, a different type, calcium citrate, there's gummies um, that you can take, and these are actually good, I, I take these myself, they're tasty. Um, so I do recommend that, but you don't have to swallow a pill every day. Um, calcium citrate though, there are pills, Costco actually has the calcium citrate, and that's the type that does not need to be taken with food for absorption. But you do want to split it up during the day if you're not getting any calcium in your diet, you should take a little bit in the morning, so one supplement in the morning and one at night. Um, there's other types of calcium in foods, phosphate, gluconate, and lactate, but I think the two most common are the calcium carbonate and the calcium citrate. So the other component um, is vitamin D. And vitamin D is tough to get through the diet. Um, it's added to milk and some orange juice, but in very low quantities. So if you look at the label, it's about 100 IUs. It's, it's very hard to get the recommended dose of 1,000 IUs daily. Um, and that's how much 800 to 1,000 is currently the recommendation, which I have a slide on that later. So you can get vitamin D from the sun. That's one of the way. But then again, we need sunscreen here in San Diego. And, Worldwide, we don't want to get skin cancer, so it kind of becomes a balance. And I say to most people, take, you may need to take a supplement. So I do recommend a supplement. Vitamin D, 1,000 IU is generally the standard dose. Some people may need more for absorption. Um, the maximum dose I recommend is 4,000 IU currently. I know there's been a lot of hype over vitamin D um, in the last few years, but there's a, a lot of articles that are about to be published showing that um, more more than that may not be the best, and, and there'll be some controversy to come, so um, read your newspapers. But I think that the Institute of Medicine does recommend 4,000 as the maximum, and 1,000 to 2,000 as really where you should be. So I do follow those guidelines for now, until we have more literature. There was a lot of thought on vitamin D, does it prevent breast cancer and heart disease and a lot of links. And actually at this time, there's been associations, but there's been no causality. I think it would be great if we could find that. Um, and that would be great, but at this time the studies have not shown that in even some recent studies. So I think vitamin D is excellent, and I believe that levels I always recommend above 30 um, in patients to kind of keep their level above that. But the literature really shows that less than 20 is where the fractures happen and where things happen. So, um, and when we first started testing, when I started testing people when it became a topic back in 2008, 
many people were in their 20s and lower and myself when I got tested I was 22 so um, it's hard to say what the exact measurement is but all the real good studies show that less than 20 is when your fracture risk goes up but more studies to come but I generally tell patients to keep it around 30. So the other big thing with osteoporosis is exercise, weight-bearing exercise specifically. And that's a very big prevention um, measure. So three to four times a week or a little bit every day, at least 30 minutes, helps the bones. And so by exercise, um, I typically give a handout to my patients, you need to do something weight-bearing. So walking is great. Walking is a great weight-bearing exercise. You're putting the weight of your body, the force, and that sh builds bone by one to two percent. It's been shown to increase bone mineral density. Um, more vigorous is great too, jumping jacks, running, hiking, but you know, walking itself is a great exercise for a lot of people. The exercises that are not good for osteoporosis are biking and swimming. So I do have a lot of male bikers in my practice and, th and they're always riding their bikes, but they're not walking and they have a lot of osteoporosis and that's because you're not putting the weight on your own body. So I encourage people, get out and walk, do some weight bearing exercise. Resistance training is great as well. Um, that helps the resistance, just low weights even at the gym is great exercise and mix it up. Um, we have an exercise physiologist at UCSD, Robin Sturr, who gives a lot of talks and the best thing, you know, she really says is to mix up and vary your exercise. But I say to people if they have trouble with weight bearing, walking alone is a wonderful thing and, any, and weights as well. So like I said, I already went through this, so low impact, walking, high impact, jumping rope, hiking. Um, and try to do the exercises with greatest impact but that do not cause issues, obviously joint problems or things like that. And 30 minutes um, at a moderate pace most days. And so muscle strengthening as well um, is good for exercise and weights. So the other big key is fall prevention. Um, people want to be careful, um, use handrails, keep floors clutter free, use rubber mats, use good lighting. Um, so fall prevention is key, being very careful if you're at risk and you have osteoporosis is another part. Um, there used to be something called, um, there is something called hip protectors that, um, that studies have really shown didn't help prevent hip fractures, but there, are, there is something out there if people are high risk um, that they can wear these pads that if they fell that it would help protect. But studies on this have been not so good. So we don't really recommend them at this time because studies have been variable on that, but they are available. So therapies for osteoporosis, specifically the medications, um, so there's many FDA approved therapies for osteoporosis. Um, we have the bisphosphonates, which I mentioned, um, alendronate, which is Fosamax, resendronate, abandronate, which is Boniva, and sorry, resendronate, which is Actinel, and zoledronic acid, which is the intravenous one, once yearly, which is IV reclast. Uh, Reloxifene is an estrogen agonist antagonist. Calcitonin, actually, we don't use it all anymore. I should probably take it off the list, but I left it on there because many people may have been treated with that in the past. But there was a big study, the PROOF study in 2006, which did not show any um, improvement for osteoporosis. There's a newer medication, which I'll talk about, called denosumab and, um, or prolia, and teriparatide or um, forteo, which helps with formation. That's the only medicine we have, which I'll talk about, which actually builds back the bone. So our treatment objection, objectives in osteoporosis are, we want to do two things. You have two bone cells. One is the osteoclast, um, which breaks down your bone, and the osteoblast, which is, builds up the bone and helps make the bone. And our bone is constantly remodeling. It's breaking down, it's building up. And these are the two targets that our therapies, um, uh, the two areas that our, tar our therapies target. So the bisphosphonates um, work by inhibiting the osteoclast. So by preventing the bone breakdown, they stabilize the network. And while they don't build new bone, they make it stronger and prevent fractures. So um, there's the oral and intravenous form, and there are some side effects. Um, kidney function, rash, um, it can cause reflux or inflammation in your esophagus. And um, something called osteonecrosis of the jaw has been associated with this. And this is an infection of the jaw that can occur because you're not remodeling your bone. Um, this actually is very rare. 
with oral uh, bisphosphonates. There's actually been less than 100 cases just with the orals alone, true cases of this. Um, but I know it's, it caused a lot of hype and people get worried when, the, when they're going for dental implants. Um, and it is still a concern and someone should stop their bisphosphonates, but it's really with severe dental work that they might put them at risk for this. So, um, you know, I've been using these medicines often for five years and haven't seen it. I will say in patients that have cancer that actually might need these treatments more often. So a lot of patients, we get, when we give the intravenous form, we give it once yearly, but some patients are getting that monthly. Um, and that's sometimes where the risk of the jaw comes in. So this is the intravenous medicine, uh, zolindronic acid, um, and it's used once yearly to treat osteoporosis. And I just wanted to highlight it because it's one of the newer treatments. Um, so it's a once yearly 15 minute infusion and it, and it works, it goes directly into your bones. So you don't have to take an oral medication like the other ones and it goes directly to the bones and it works. And it has, in the studies, it really reduces fractures nicely over three years. Um, there was a 70% three year reduction, so it works really well. There's no comparison trials to the oral medications. So when patients ask me, well, should I do the oral or the intravenous, it's really a, ma a matter of preference or insurance costs because there really has been shown to be no different. Theore theoretically, since it's not absorbed and it goes straight to the bone, there may, it may be a better medication, but there's been no um, studies that will show this. Um, and so what I tell my patients when they get this medicine is that you actually can be at risk for some flu-like illnesses. And you, if anybody's ever had it, you can get fevers, chills, um, a few days after this infusion. And so what they've shown is that if you give someone Tylenol um, every four to six hours when you take this medication, it actually lessens these symptoms. So I have my patients take Tylenol when they're receiving this medicine, and that's really reduced these side effects. And if someone gets the side effects, they usually only last about a week, and I haven't seen anything beyond that. Um, so when to use this one, it might be different if somebody cannot swallow medicines, maybe an increased fracture reduction, and insurances do cover it. So I just wanted to highlight this medication since it's newer, but the oral bisphosphonates um, have been around you know, since 1997 and longer in the studies, so they're excellent as well. So the next medicine I want to talk about is something called teriparatide or Forteo. Now this medicine is the only one we have that works on the osteoblast, the cells that build back the bone. This is the only medicine that builds back our bone. And um, it works, it actually is a parathyroid, so we have glands here that are parathyroid hormone that help stimulate um, when given just intermittently, it actually builds, causes these cells to build back bone and increase bone mass. So it's approved um, for people that have had fractures, who have had um, who have really low bone density, so when the T-score is minus three, or if they've fractured on a, another therapy. And it actually is a pen that looks like this, and a patient will give this um, once daily and inject into their thigh or into their belly over two years. So it's actually only FDA approved for two years um, time, and that is because there's actually a black box warning on it. And that is that Forteo, when they gave this to, in research studies, in rats at much higher, 20 times the doses, three up to 60 times doses that we give to humans, they found that rats were having bone cancer or increased risk of osteosarcoma, it's called a malignant bone tumor. Now this medicine has been out for over 10 years and there actually, in the studies, there were no reports of human bone cancer, but in the, when you actually go and talk to the company, there was a case of um, a man with prostate cancer who received excessive radiation that did develop it, whether it was due to the radiation or this Forteo, that's to be told, but there have been no other cases reported in humans. Um, so that being said, that's why it's only used for two years because it's thought after two years the risk goes up of bone cancer and, um, and, you know, and the risk really hasn't been shown in the trials. So that is a, a risk though of taking this medication. Um, and so the duration of therapy is for two years, as I said. And this does reduce the risk of fractures nicely. It reduces um, new uh, vertebral fractures and hip fractures as well, so spine fractures and hip fractures. And there's also other side effects with this medicine. I'd say it's actually tolerated very well, but there can be some leg cramps or what I often hear in the first month, some dizziness, um, and like I said, the black box warning. So 
the issue is that it is contraindicated in anybody who's received radiation. So anybody who's received radiation for another cancer, that's why we don't give it because then potentially when you have had radiation, your risk for bone cancer is already a little bit higher than the average population. Um, but, and that is why we, it's contraindicated in that group. So it's also contraindicated in, um, and it can't be used in people. So with the history of radiation, um, anybody with high calcium levels, pregnancy, younger people, um, and anybody that's had a cancer in their bone, obviously it would be contraindicated, and um, something called Paget's disease, which is a disorder of <coughs> bone remodeling, it can't be used. So before I um, administer this medicine to anyone, I check a lot of blood tests, and I actually, if any of you are on it or are being followed by your physician, I recommend that you have blood tests every three months while on this to follow these markers to make sure that there's not a risk. There's a level called the alkaline phosphatase and I make sure that that's not increasing or anything is abnormal. So I watch p my patients very closely on this medicine um, because of the risk. But I will tell you it's very well tolerated and patients do very well and it does build back the, sp the bone nicely. When I get repeat bone densities in a lot of patients, it's the one time that you see an increase. I can see things, I've had patients up to seven to 10% of increase in their spine bone density. You'll get that back on a bone density. So, you know, it, and even if it doesn't change, it's still nice. People really do well on this medicine and it builds back their bones. So another medicine that's used is something called Reloxifene or Avista. It's a, only used in women. It's an estrogen agonist antagonist. Now, what does that mean? That means that it um, actually in the breast tissue, it actually does inhibits estrogen. It does not allow estrogen to act and thus reduces the risk of breast cancer. And so this medicine is also has another use. It's used in patients who are very high risk for breast cancer, people with a family history to reduce their risk of breast cancer. But it's also used for osteoporosis because it helps with the estrogen and actually causes increases of bone density at the level of the spine. Now this is a medication, I tend to use this in a younger population um, that might have just low bone density in the spine because this actually only worked in spine bone density. And this also decreased fracture risk nicely by about 30%. But you can see by this picture, when we use the word non-vertebral or hip fractures, at three years, it actually did not reduce the rate of hip fractures. So it started to look like it was nice, but then it came back. And so it did not reduce the risk of hip fractures. So this should be used in someone with low spine bone mineral density. I prefer to use it in a younger population because of the side effects. Um, there is an increased risk of uh, deep venous thrombosis, so blood clots in the legs, um, which is a side effect and low risk, and it can cause high fla hot flashes. And one study did show that there was a slight increased risk of stroke um, in high-risk populations, and that means um, in an older population um, with risk factors, of course, but I tend to use this medication in younger patients, and, um, and, and that's why I, I do worry about the stroke risk in an, older, in an older population. So this is an oral medicine that's taken once daily that can be used to help the spine bone density. Um, and the last medication that I'll talk about is a newer medication. This has been out since 2010, and it's called denosumab, or prol prolia. So it's a human monoclonal antibody, and it works by inhibiting the osteoclast or the breakdown of um, the bone. So it inhibits those cells, like I said, and it works through a whole different pathway um, than bisphosphonates. And that's the big thing. It works differently than Fosamax and the other agents that we've heard of. So there was a large trial, and now it's extended out to six years, uh, called the Freedom Trial, where they use this. And this medicine um, looks like a vaccine, actually. It's in administered subcutaneously into, so right here, like a vaccine, um, twice a year. So you come into your doctor's office, and twice a year, you will receive that. And it reduced uh, the risk of fractures very nicely and looked very promising, but there were some side effects. Um, there was an increased risk of skin infection, um, meaning some itchiness, some um, soft tissue infection, some redness on the arms. And there is the risk that it can cause over-suppression of the bone, meaning that you're inhibiting the bone cells from remodeling and that it can cause possibly these, these risk of a fracture itself. But that's over time. Um, there were no other major risk factors with this. 
So this is a new mechanism, and it does. And the other good thing is it does not accumulate in your bone. So you all may have heard, and I'll talk about when I talk about the controversies that bisphosphonates or Fosamax and medicines like that go into the bone and um, stay there and may stay there for a very long time. This medicine, once you stop it, it's gone from your system. So it works as you're using it, but then it, it's out of your system right away. Um, and the other big thing with this medicine is it can be used in kidney patients with major kidney dysfun dysfunction. So anybody with um, chronic kidney disease, this can be used as well. And that's something that the other medicines cannot. So it is a newer medication, which I'm always conservative about that. We still have a lot to learn about this medicine, but I've used it in my patients and people are doing well. Um, and there'll be other major studies with it. Um, and there are the, you know, possible major side effects. There were some of these skin infections, so things that we're looking at with this. But it is, and it, th possibly the thought that it's quickly reversible may not be a good thing in some ways that once you stop it, your risk of reduction of fractures is gone. So, so those are all the major medications that we have today. Um, and so what is the duration of the treatment effect? And so one of the questions that a lot of my patients ask, and I put up this slide, is that with um, Alendronate or Fosamax, um, does it continue to work? Can I stop the drug? Many of you may have heard of a drug holiday. So this slide just nicely shows that when they took um, patients that were on the medicine and at five years they took a group and took them off of the medicine and just left them and they took the group and kept them on for the next five years up to ten years on the medicine they saw that the risk of fractures especially in the first year was the same and even out to ten years even though the risk started to go up once a patient had been off the alendronate the Fosamax for five years the risk started to go up again so this tells us that we may, that when you take this bisphosphonate medicine, it stays in your body and that you may be protected for at least a good year, we know, and maybe up to five years so that it continues to work. So right now the question becomes, how long should you treat with this medicine of bisphosphonate? So um, basically for 10 years max, and some people are even saying five years. So if you're lower risk and you're on it but, and you need it, five years, this is generally the recommendations I follow. This is a nice article that explains it. So if your risk is moderately increased, you can treat for five to 10 years and then stay off of it for a few years or use a different medicine. If you are high risk, 10 years does seem to be uh, the maximum that I would stay on it now. And the reason being that there are these risks of atypical fractures that your bone doesn't remodel and you're on this for so long that you could, they could just snap and break. Um, so I do recommend um, stopping even high-risk patients. I take them off at 10 years and we use something else. So one thing that you can be reassured is that if you, so a lot of patients ask me and I put up the slide because let's say you, you come back and your bone density hasn't changed and you had a repeat bone density test two years later, you actually still are okay. Your fracture year, even if you haven't had a change in bone density, your risk is still low. Um, and your fracture risk is still low, even with the change in bone density. So that is good news, but if, of course, if it decreased, then your risk goes up. But even just no change in your bone density over time is actually good uh, if you're in a good place. So just to end, I want to touch on some recent controversies, which I've glossed over as um, I was speaking. So long-term bisphosphonate use and atypical fractures, the proton pump inhibitors and hip fracture, calcium and increased risk of heart attack. Many of you may have heard that in the newspapers. And what are the adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D? So I just want to briefly touch on this atypical femur fracture. Um, and I just want to show you the picture. So I have had about six patients who have had this atypical fracture and it breaks and it's lower down than a typical hip fracture. And that's what my patients who have had it, it looks like. And many of them were on the bisphosphonates for more than 10 years. Now it is a, not a good fracture, but it is rare. And I do want to highlight that um, the, rate, the rate that they've been finding in the studies, these are still rare fractures, but they can happen. And that's why we stop, if you are on a medicine like Alendronate, Fosamax, Reclass, Boniva, all of those medications, you do want to stop at the 10 year point because your risk goes up for these. Um, and so, and oftentimes they are bilateral. It was found in some studies that they're more common in the Asian population 
and in people with prior um, bisphosphonate use on these medicines. So that is what the, these, this is when the newspapers come out and talk about them. This is what it looks like to a patient. Um, so management, if somebody has these, I take them off of their medicine. I consider the medicine called Forteo or Teriparatide to remodel and grow back the bone. And I monitor them closely. These are very slow healing fractures and they need to be looked at very closely. Um, and, so, and often these are, need surgery. So I already talked about this in the past, about the proton pump inhibitors, Nexium, Prilosec, do these decrease calcium absorption and increase your risk for hip fractures. And actually, um, the recent, most recent studies suggest that in people who are smoking on these, that's the, the population that gets the hip fracture. And then the, a big topic is that in 2010, there was a big study that showed a possible association between having a heart attack and greater than 1,500 milligrams of calcium daily. And then there was a big study recently that showed no association between it, but actually just recently another study did show that there is association. So I think we're going back and forth as we often do in the literature. And I think to be safe, um, you know, I do follow these current recommendations, 1,200 milligrams. I also think to be safe that in the group that took their calcium through their diet, they're finding in studies that that actually might be safer than with the supplements alone. Sometimes people are getting calcium that they're not realizing, and so they may be on much higher. So remember, people were told to take 1,500 milligrams of calcium, and on top of that, people could have been eating milk and cheese and yogurt and getting almost 3,000 milligrams of calcium a day. So I think now it's, it's better that, you know, I gave you the calcium calculator, think about what you're taking, see how much you're taking, see how much supplement you really need, and aim for 1,200 total. And that's diet plus supplement if you need it. Um, and so for men, 1,200 milligrams for women older than 50, 1,200 milligrams for men older than 70, and 1,000 for men um, older than 50. So the, as I said, obtain from food sources. Now vitamin D, as I showed you before, the 800 to 1,000 is what I recommend, unless otherwise told by your physician. There are some people who need more or less, depending. And um, the maximum dose is the 4,000. And so I'll quickly just end. Um, there are some new therapies on the horizon. Um, and one was really exciting because we did the study here at UCSD, Odonacaptib. Um, it's currently going, finishing its trial, but it looks very promising and it's a whole new pathway. And it's called a cathepsin. It inhibits a whole pathway that will actually help with bone building and remodeling. It will be an oral medication. And this is the closest medication we have right now to FDA approval. Now that could be three years from now, but this, does, this medicine looked very promising with low side effects and really increased bone mineral density. So hopefully we'll have some new oral medications on the horizon that will work through newer pathways um, than the pathways we have now that will give more options to people to treat their osteoporosis. So I end just by guiding you to this website. I always give my patients a handbook when they leave the office. And I really like the National Osteoporosis Foundation website. There's a patient handbook on that that lists all the activities that are great for um, improving your bone density and doing the exercises. There's all um, about calcium, this calcium calculator. There's, and they're the most up to date. If something happens, a controversy comes out about calcium or heart attacks, they're the first to list it on their website and weigh in on it. So if you want to be most up to date, I really like this website. Um, and so I just went through at the end, and I've actually already talked about this, all their guidelines, um, which are very useful, and you can find that on the website. And the other thing I will tell you is we actually have, are running an, a bone health group, an osteosuppression porosis support group here at UCSD. Dr. Deb Cotto, another physician here who treats osteoporosis and I are running this group. Um, it meets the first Wednesday of every month over at Thornton Hospital. And I can give some information. I didn't bring the form today, but it is on our UCSD website somewhere. And um, you can come and we do all different kinds of talks. We bring in all different kinds of lectures. We had an exercise physiologist come to talk about exercise. We had Dr. Diane Schneider, who's a thought leader here in San Diego, come and talk last time. And so we, we bring in speakers all the time. So I encourage you to join us if you can in that. And um, that is the end. Any qu I gave you guys a lot of information. I'm sorry, but I hope you learned something tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Question. So the question is, how do you determine 
if your bone mineral density is low in the spine if you only do a hip bone density. So some people cannot have a, have a spine bone density and that's why in that FRAX guideline we only use the hip because the spine is harder to assess through a bone density scan because it can be falsely elevated. Osteoarthritis, which is a completely different from osteoporosis, can falsely elevate the readings. And so sometimes we just have to rely on the hip alone. Now the other thing you can do is I'll, sometimes when I can't measure the spine is I look at what's called the distal one-third radius, which in this bone there's a lot of what's called cortical bone, and that is a measurement that I use to look at and follow as well. But the hip, you know, some, often then I rely on the hip. I also sometimes can get a gauge from x-rays or pa past history of fractures about the spine, but x-ray is really not the best modality to look at osteoporosis, really the bone density scan. But that's why sometimes people's spine cannot be used or if people have scoliosis or other abnormalities of the spine if they've had surgery, we can't always look at the spine. So we have to rely on the hip bone density. So the question is, what is your opinion on the medication strontium citrate? Correct. So strontium ranolate, just to talk, is a medicine that actually is approved in Europe. Um, it's a mineral that is approved in Europe for the treatment of osteoporosis, but it is not FDA approved in the United States. And it is a medicine that works by building up bone density, both, it works actually on both these, the, both cells, the osteoblast that builds up and breaks down. It's an oral medication that can only, uh, it, it is approved in Europe. Now we do not have the FDA approval here, but there is something called strontium citrate that is available. And I cannot, you know, recommend that for or against it. Actually, I was just at the National Osteoporosis Foundation and heard a lot of speakers, and it's tough to really say whether this is, does improve the bone mineral density or not, because it is a heavy metal, and what happens is it goes into your bones, and so when you get your next bone density, it will look like there's great improvement. But you have to tell the technician that you're on this medicine, because it can falsely elevate your scores. So it may work, and I hope it's a useful thing, and there are studies on <coughs> its sister drug, the ranolate, that it does improve the bone density in the spine, um, but there are side effects to it, and, um, and it's not FDA approved here in the U.S. So while it can be helpful, there may be some downsides as well. So um, I cannot, you know, for approve until there's more studies. Now there are some studies that are being done looking at the strontium citrate here in the U.S., but we don't have any data today. Um, so the question was, <laughs> do you know of any foods that leach the calcium out, or I'll add, are bad for the bones? Um, so I think one big thing that I think I forgot to mention that's controversial is sodas. Um, and sodas contain an element called phosphoric acid, and actually there's data to show an association between soda intake um, and, you know, and this is more than three glasses to show that, that this can actually leach calcium and cause um, you know, osteoporosis. So I think I always tell my patients, we talk about caffeine as well. Now caffeine can have some effects on the calcium absorption leaching, but, um, but actually when you take it with a supplement or you're taking um, the right amount of calcium, it hasn't been shown to d reduce the absorption. So as long as you take the calcium. But I think soda is something that they're studying and that we'll find out more about. Now another food that you mentioned, spinach, um, actually um, which a lot of people think is a really good source of calcium it actually contains something called oxalates in it which don't really help with the absorption of calcium as much so spinach is not necessarily the, a good calcium rich food and I'll tell you I just went to I heard one of the world renowned experts speak on calcium um, in the foods and Connie Weaver um, and she's one of the world experts and really she said the best source is still milk and actually fortified bread and fortified orange juice. And, I, and a couple of the nutritionists have told me that these have the most calcium in it. It's not to say don't eat your broccoli and your other vegetables. They're great for many reasons, but um, you know, those are the best sources of calcium in the diet still. And some of those fortified foods get you the most calcium possible. And I will say that there is, if anyone reads the New York Times, um, Jane Brody, she always writes these nice articles on osteoporosis. And there was an article a few years ago, and they are doing research into something called a low um, protein diet, looking at protein and acid and its effect on bones in your diet. And so there's a lot of research going on about this now. So stay tuned because we may find that there is a very big bone healthy diet and about protein sources in our diet and how they affect our bone health. So that is being studied. So the question is about these proteins and is milk really a good source 
to get your calcium and does it affect your bones? So I've read the China study book and I, you know, I think that there still hasn't been, I mean, there is his evidence, but we are doing studies and there hasn't been any conclusive evidence yet that these diets hurt your bones done here in the United States and they have been researching it. So there's some that show yes and some that show no. So I think we need some more conclusive evidence. I mean, the China study does show that, but I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say at this point. We haven't proven it here. Yes. So the first question is, does NSAIDs affect bisphosphonate use? So Motrin, ibuprofen, does regular use? So regular use has been associated with some, because um, I put up a big category of pain medicines, but regular NSAID use over a long period of time could be associated with osteoporosis and bone loss. So that means chronic Motrin use, ibuprofen, those medicines. But, is it contraindicated? but it's not at all contraindicated to a bisphosphonate to using a bisphosphonate whatsoever. The only time that a bisphosphonate is contraindicated, which might be affected by these medicines, is when your, these medicines can sometimes hurt the kidney. And so when your kidney function declines, you don't want to use a bisphosphonate in certain situations. So, so the question is, does the DEXA heal test give enough information? So the answer is, many of my colleagues actually here at the university are working on really interesting studies and I hope that one day we will find that that will be a good test because we definitely, bone density is not necessarily the best test, but at the current time um, I do use just the bone density test and I don't think you should rely on the HEAL test until it's been well studied and well proven and out in the literature. So I do not, and that might bring up another question I'll just add that a lot of people might ask about the quantitative CT scanning, um, if anyone's ever had that, so they were using um, CT scans to look at the bone density and to get more of a volumetric input and I don't recommend those either um, because it is a lot of radiation and bone density testing can be done often and so I go, still go by the gold standard is the bone density test of the hip and the spine and that's the gold standard. Yes. The question is how often do you recommend a DEXA scan or bone density scan. So Medicare will only pay for it every two, two years and actually um, there have been some studies recently that shows maybe waiting a little bit longer is okay because bone density changes over time. But if somebody's on treatment and I want to see something more quickly, I might do a year. Um, but in standard, I might wait two years. Um, it really just depends on the situation. In a younger patient that has osteoporosis, and maybe with 65 and the bones look good, I might wait five years before I repeat the bone density. So I would say the answer is really case by case depending on where you are. But two years is the standard insurance wise and in general. Yes. The question is on Forteo, would the same amounts of calcium and vitamin D be recommended? And the answer is on any of these medications, they work best when you are um, adequ have adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D, so you should take the standard doses. Oh, www.nof.org. And that stands for National Osteoporosis Foundation. Yeah. So the question is, are there side effects to taking vitamin D or reactions? When you say you put your intestines to sleep, that you become very constipated then with vitamin D alone? Okay. Yeah, so there are many side effects um, to v vitamin D and calcium. And after the lecture, you and I can discuss more in detail about it, but there are, I have had some people have side effects when you're uh, to the high dose vitamin D, sometimes when people are very low, we put them on 50,000 once weekly, and I have had some people have side effects. I actually had a case of vitamin D toxicity, a patient who was taking 100,000 IUs daily, um, and there's been many case reports in the literature now that everyone's gone crazy on vitamin D. I had a patient actually last week who was taking 10,000 IUs daily, which is still a lot. That's the maximum dose that's below the level that's thought to be toxic. But my patient on 100,000, her level came out to 250 when I measured her vitamin D, which is really high, and she had so many symptoms. And so that's, that's a different situation. But in terms of the vitamin D replacement itself, um, you know, I have had a few people who get have some interesting kidney side effects and strange, but it is rare. So I'd be happy to talk to you after the lecture. So thank you all for your time.